This week, I want to begin a series uh, that really started in my heart uh, back in June. Uh, and I had a, an experience with God this past summer, and I've said really nothing about it because it just, I didn't feel like it was the right time. And the series is called Raw Faith, Living the Impossible. And I'll, I'll talk to you about where that term came from. But the reality of it is this, that the God of the universe, listen, the God of all creation, has invited every one of us into a custom design mission for our church and for your individual life. And this, this, this series is about you discovering your part. What is, what is God, what is my part in your mission? And then what do you have for me on a personal basis? How do I, through raw faith, discover my part, empowered by the grace of God? And I think when we get through this today, you're going to understand where we're going to be heading in the next three weeks, how impacting this can be in your life if you'll open your heart to your Heavenly Father. You know, this, it, it's, it's literally about coming from, from where you are today to where God's called you to be and doing it through the avenue of raw faith. And so uh, I, I want to take the time today, and, and I have a couple of announcements I'm going to be sharing with you, and I want you to understand that God wants you to live the impossible in your life. He really does. He wants you to live the impossible. And the takeaway is simply this, that you will know how to. Everyone say know how. Yeah. See, just messages without theory, just a theory doesn't do it. I want you to leave today knowing how to actually enter into a raw faith to actually do the part God's called you to do in his kingdom and for your personal life. Now, sometimes we think of the work of God as something separate from us. That's preacher's jobs. But the fact of it is, we are all the body of Christ. And what you have to understand, and this is not a, a subjective thing, because most Christians live a bifurcated life. They live their, their, what they, their own life and then the part that, they, you know, we're going to do something for God maybe. Well, it's just the opposite. The fact of it is, the, the Scripture said we were created for His pleasure. When the purpose and mission that God has for, his, for, his, for the earth and for His church, of which if you're a child of God, you are part of the body of Christ. It's when you step into that part of your life that the other part of your life becomes fulfilling. In fact, Jesus said it this way, when you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, the things that people seek for, God adds to you. Think of the children of Israel. When the nation of Israel, were, when they came out of Egyptian slavery and bondage and eventually got into the promised land, they entered into the promised land as a nation, into a land that the scripture said flowed with milk and honey, and it was a, an amazing place. And yet, they went in as a nation, but the individual families were also blessed. They had their individual homes, slaves one day, and now, uh, uh, actually a generation later, they owned their own homes, they had their own land, they had their own stuff. God began to bless them and their children and their children's children after them. And so, I want, I want you to understand that you can't separate these two things. But if you're like me, you can get busy in life. Anybody ever get busy? And you kind of feel like, well, I've got to solve this problem. I've got to do this. I've got to jump this and run through that. And you'll miss out that living this life of raw faith, inspired by the grace of God, empowered by the grace of God, is what will actually change everything in your world. Now, let me, let me start, take you back to where this started. This past spring or so, I just began to have like a, I don't know, in my heart a knowing. And just I, as I talk to God and pray, and I just knew, Lord, somehow I'm, I'm missing it as the pastor of this church. I know there's something that I'm missing that I need to, to yield to you to understand to do. And because I knew it wasn't our staff, we have an amazing staff, and I know it's not you, because I said, Lord, this is an incredible group of people. Through the years, they've just, man, they've been incredible. And, and what I'm about to tell you wasn't because there was any problems. In fact, when I came into the office, which my office is back here now because we've thrown everybody out of their offices to create more kid space. And so I'm back here now. Uh, which is kind of nice, to be honest with you. It's, it's, a, it's okay. We have Steve Moore in a closet back there, which makes me really happy. <laughs> anyway, but, uh, but, but here's the deal. I came in this weekend, and there was a box on my desk, and it's from Outreach Magazine. Now, many of you might know what Outre Ma Outreach Magazine is. It's pretty much the most predominant Christian magazine in, in the country today. And, and what it was, and it had a little, like this kind of plaque thing, and, and what Outreach Magazine does every year is it, it takes data from throughout the nation and it, and it ranks the fastest growing churches in the country. This year, I just got the, the notification, uh, the, the actual stuff yesterday. When I walked in last night, 
is that this year, this past year, Victory was the 45th fastest growing church in the nation. So it's, it's good stuff happening, and we're grateful to God for that. Now, you'll see when I get through this, there's no boasting in that. It's only by the mercy, grace, and kindness of God. But I say that to tell you, it wasn't like bad things were happening. But I knew God was putting things in my heart that I was drawing back from. Because they required to truly be able to step into a place of faith and to lead from that, that place. And, and I, I couldn't put my mind around it, my heart around it. And so we were on vacation, and I had lunch with Michelle's mom's pastor. He has a great church that he pastors. He's older than I am. And, and, I, and I thought, you know, I'd like to really sit down with him and, and connect to him and ask him some questions. So we had lunch, and I began to talk to him about this. And I said, now, let me tell you what I told him. I said, Lonnie, his name's Lonnie Johns. I said, Lonnie, listen, I, I, you know, we, we, for the, through the years, the church started with, you know, nothing and no one and just, and it's grown and grown. And, and yet this last initiative of which we need to build a building for kids space and small groups. And I, I said, I feel like it's just not the people haven't connected to it. And I said, but here's what I know. I know it's not our staff. I know, no, I know it's not the people because these are remarkable people. I know I'm failing somewhere, but I can't get my mind around it. I can't get my heart around it. I said, do you think you can help me? He said, I probably can. He said, John, let me ask you a question. 24 years ago or so, when you and Michelle started Victory Family Church, did you have money? I said, no, there was no money. He said, well, did you have a group of people that you had prepared for a year or two to go start the church with you? I said, no, we, we didn't have anybody. We just started and 33 people showed up. He said, did you have equipment? I said, no, we didn't have any equipment. He said, did, were you strategic? I said, I didn't know what that meant. No, I'm, I'm, somebody asked me, you must have done a demographic study to come to Cranberry. I didn't know what they meant 24 years ago. I don't know. What do you mean a demographic study? Why would you do that? I have no, all I knew, God called us to come, we went. And we started and it kept growing. I said, that's all I know. He said, so how did each step of the, of, of, of time, every time Victory took a step and, and bought land and then built and then bought land and then built and then added on and how did all that happen all the time? And I, in essence, said to him, I said, well, it, back and forth, I said, well, it was kind of like just a raw faith. And he said, John, this last time, did you do that? Or did you become strategic because the church had grown? And because you were, have all this data in front of you and these amazing people and these amazing resources of a staff and this incredible congregation. And, and I hesitated, which told the story. He said, he said, yeah, I understand. He said, I've done that as well. I ended up, after I talked to him, I talked to other pastors, and, and I explained to them, I said, hey, help me with this. And, and all the guys I talked to said, I'm doing it right now. Because what ends up happening is that you don't mean to do it, but you start to put your confidence into the very things that God built instead of in God. And so what I failed to do was actually get to this place of what I'll explain to you shortly, a, a, just a simple, raw faith. And, and you know, it's a subtle form of pride. Because you begin to think that maybe I, you know, I can just simply look at this, share it with the church, and we'll just go do it. And it's really a form of pride. And when I began to, after I talked to Lonnie, I began to pray about it. And I realized, I said, wait a minute. Other than doing this, my only other qualification, only job I'm qualified for that I did pretty well at was Burger King. <laughs> what makes you start thinking, where do you get off thinking you're going to sit down and be Joe's strategy and, and look at this and, well, this would be appropriate. And I said, who, 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 you're not that guy. You are the guy that heard God's voice and you went and did what he said do and he showed up and you went, whoo hoo. <laughs> and so... I made a commitment. That, that happened on, on January, on, on June 30th. So I began to do that immediately. And so, I, and let me read you a scripture to kind of give you a context even further. Romans 4.16 says this. Therefore, the promise of God, and in this context, he's talking about righteousness. Therefore, the promise comes by faith so that it might be by grace and may be guaranteed to all of Abraham's offspring. Abraham is, of course, the father of us all in the faith. Abraham's offspring referring not just to the Jew, but to anyone who's in Christ. Now listen to what he said. The promise of God comes to an individual, listen, by believing. Not by strategy, not by working, not by being, you know, I'm going to burn the midnight oil. And then he said, and, listen to this, the next sentence, so that it might be by the grace of God. Grace is divine enablement. So here's the amazing thing about God. 
He makes a promise. He said, the only way you receive my promise is through faith. Faith is the only thing the scripture said. Without it, it's impossible to please God. Faith is, the, is when you believe what God says, independently of everything you see or you touch or have experienced, you make God, you say, God, you be true and everything else in my life a liar. That you magnify what God says instead of magnifying your symptoms, your, your circumstances, your, your failures, your past. He said, you have to simply believe me. And then, John, I'm going to give you grace or divine enablement that will enable you to actually trust me like that. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So when you hear my word, now I'm going to give you ability to actually trust me. And he said, and because of this, John, my promise now is guaranteed to everybody. Because here's, here's, here, otherwise it would be this. The smartest people would have greater access to the promise of God. The people who have greater strategies. Maybe the people that grew up in homes where they were nurtured. You know, there are people in this room that you were fortunate when you grew up. Your mom and dad, they put you on their lap. Oh, you're going to be amazing. You're amazing. You're amazing. You're amazing. I love, we love you. You're amazing. And then there are a lot of us in this room, you grew up and you weren't called amazing. You were called other stuff. And it would sound something like this. Beep, 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 beep. And that's not a car. <laughs> and some of us in this room, you were abandoned. You weren't nurtured. You were obliterated by the people that should have taken care of you. No offense to them. No, no, dis, no, no disrespect to them. It just is what it is. And so how is it that one person nurtured with opportunities, with all these, and then another who has nothing? God levels the playing field. He said, I don't do anything for anybody with my promise except they trust me, and I will give them the grace to trust me, and it levels the playing field. Therefore, my promise is guaranteed to everybody. I don't know about you, that gives me a lot of hope. Because if it wasn't for people like me, you in the top half of the class wouldn't have existed. <laughs> just, so, just so you know, I was, in the top, I was in the top such and such percent of my class, yet yeah, it would mean nothing without me. You stand on my shoulders, big boy, all right? So I began to do this. I, I, I put aside all, and I didn't say a word. You didn't hear me say virtually anything about the building anymore. I did it on purpose. People would say, well, why aren't you talking about the building? Because I was talking about it in the right context now. I wanted to talk to God about it first before I talked to you. And so here's all I would do. I would, here's what I, because I knew in my heart, God had burned in my soul. And you've heard me talk about the necessity of reaching the next generation. Things I know Michelle and Dana, Steve's wife, Steve Moore's wife, and, and another lady in our church, uh, Lori Shallis, they were meeting together to pray out some things regarding the next generation. And I'm trying to think, how can we strategically do that? And I'm putting it off years. So I stopped that. And then I began to, through faith, see, the simplest exercise of faith is when you agree with God, no matter what you feel. And I began to proclaim what I know he put in my heart. And here's what I began to say. Because I knew God wanted the multiplication to happen in this church. Not an addition. Now, we're growing, and it's amazing. But God, that's not what he's asking. He said, son, I want this to multiply. So here's what I began to say. Not pray, say. I said, Father, I, I put aside everything I feel, everything I see, and I say, because this is what kept coming in my heart, the next five years will be the greatest years this church has ever had. And I began to proclaim it because I know that's what he was putting in my soul. And I'd say, I said, Lord, I don't know how all that's going to happen. I just know it's my job through raw faith, empowered by the grace of God, to lead and do that. I began to say, Father, I thank you that we will do what you called us to do with the next generation, and we're going to do it now. We're not, this isn't on the 20-year plan. The next generation doesn't have 20 years, and we sure enough don't. And I began to proclaim it. I began to proclaim about your families that I was believing. I'm just speaking it out over my heart. Father, I thank you that that building is built and paid for. I thank you for that. And I began to thank him for the work that would occur in those buildings and, and the great things that he would do. And then 20 days later from when I met with Lonnie Johns, I was in a meeting with a, a, an old friend who came to Pittsburgh and was speaking. I didn't even know he was coming. I heard about it. Some of you may have heard of him. Some of you may not. But his name's, uh, he's a South African guy named Rodney Howard Brown. And, and Rodney and I have been friends for years. And, and uh, now if you think of John the Baptist, where he ate like camel, he wore camel's hair and he ate wild locust and honey. I mean, I mean, he ate wild honey and locusts. The dude was, he was like the original vegan, okay? The dude was not, he was wild. John the Baptist was a wild man. I think if there's a John the Baptist section, they're going to throw Rodney in that section. He's just a wild man. But I hadn't really seen him in almost, I, I, I'm guessing 15 years. 
But we were old friends, and right when he came to America, we got to know each other, and we just always just had a connection. So I went to the meeting, wanted to see my friend. And so I, I, Rodney was actually standing out when I came in, and, and, and I, got to, I saw him, and he said, oh, man, it's so good to see you. He said, why don't you just sit up by me in the front, because I just want to get to hang out. We'll talk after. I said, fine. So the meeting's going on. If you've ever been to one of Rodney's meetings, it could be wild. And, and then he stops, and he, and he has a, a prophetic word over me. Now, the interesting thing, it was actually videoed, and I'll show it to you in a minute. And what he says to me, he doesn't know a thing of what I've been praying for 20 days. He doesn't know a thing of what I've been saying out of my mouth. He doesn't know that I've stepped from being Joe's strategy, which I'm not, to simply saying, God, this is what you want. It will come to pass. And so he just stops, and he, and he begins to speak over me. Now, the Bible calls these gifts of the Spirit. The simple, there's three basic spiritual gifts that came into operation. I don't have time to teach them, but I don't want you to be ignorant of these things. The one is prophecy, which is not foretelling. Prophecy is simply speaking by divine inspiration. And then a word of knowledge and a word of wisdom. A word of knowledge is a fragment of the knowledge of God pertaining to the present or past of an individual or a group, or a nation even. And it's revealed by God to the person. Not everything, but a word, a fragment. And then a word of wisdom is a fragment or a knowledge of, of the knowledge of God pertaining to the future. How many of you know the future in God's heart and mind is as clear as it is your past is to you? He knows the end from the beginning. And so Rodney stopped, and the things I want you to see how God supernaturally will move when a man or a woman will step out of themselves into a place of faith empowered by the grace of God. And he, he starts and then he takes a little, he just stops for a minute and then he speaks these things and then we'll get right back into this. Take a look. I just see God doing supernatural things. The old ministry is about to go to another dimension. Yeah. I tell you, Father, thank you for my friend. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. In the next five years will equate to every year that's been behind you. And the best is yet to come. Amen. Hallelujah. And God's bringing the hungry people in from the north, the south, the east, and the west. People that have never even ever set foot in church. A whole new breed, a whole new generation that are going to be raised up. And people are going to be trained and sent out from your place to the nations of the earth. I just see it taking place. Thank you, Lord. And God will do a quick work. And it'll be done by the gift of faith. And you'll speak it. It shall come to pass. Get ready. Get ready. The best is yet to come. Amen. Amen. That was a good Hallelujah. night. Hallelujah. That was a good, good night. <clears throat> What I want you to see, everything he said was the essence of what I was, that when he talked about the gift of faith, he simply said, this is not going to happen through your efforts. This is going to happen by you saying what God, through the gift and the operation of faith. And he said, God's about to do something in the next, and when he said the next five years, I'm thinking, man, you talk about God wanting something done. What I've learned about God is that so often, and we all fall into it, we try to drag God to where we are to get the full blessing of his, of, his, of his person where I stand. But what I've learned is that I really, it's, it's much better to go to where he is, to what he's called you to do, what he asks you to do, to learn to discover what that means for his kingdom and for your own life. And, and you know, when you stand where God's called you, it's already blessed. You don't have to invoke him to bless what he's already blessed. So often what we do in our lives, and that's basically what I was kind of doing, is asking God to bless our, our, our attempt to do something for him. God will have no flesh glory in his presence. 
And I thought it was amazing when he talked about it being a quick work. It would be done by the gift of faith. The best is yet to come. And then he said this, a whole new generation will come. And if you'll hear me, if you've heard me share a lot lately, I'm talking to you about reaching people that Christians largely are discarding. And I'm telling you, God is wanting to do a work in this generation of rescuing people that people have given up on, that a culture, is, that a Christian culture has given up on, that they've even been deemed the enemies of the church. And can I tell you this? They are not the enemies of God. They may be enemies in their minds to God, but he so loved the world that Christ died for them. And I'm believing God, and I've been saying by faith, that the castaways, those who have been deemed worthless, even by Christians, that God sees the precious in them. Jesus died for them. And those people will be rescued, come to know Christ, and God will reach them and grasp them right where they are. And then he will lift them and love them and, and literally cause them to be changed into, by faith, from faith to faith and glory to glory into his image in their personal life. That's what we're believing God for. And as wonderful as the growth here has been, and it has been, God's wanting a multiplication. That's what he's asking for, and that's what I was drawing back from. Because I knew in reaching the next generation, I was so real to me that I know, Michelle had actually for a couple years had been praying about it, and, and I'm saying, well, you know, we'll get to this, I'm sure, it's sometime down the road. So in that 20-day period, I began to proclaim that we, and I knew, and in, in fact, I'll announce to you right now, next fall, 2018, we will open a school for ministry training here. We're going to do it right here. And I'm sitting there thinking, we're going to open, I know, I know we're already doing it. I've been praying it out. I know we're going to do it next fall. I've already talked about it with some of the staff. And literally, the Holy Spirit specifically says, they will be raised up and they'll, be, go, they'll go to the nations of the earth. The only hope of this world is Jesus and his church. That's it. Not just Jesus, but the church, his body. God does nothing independently of his body any more than your head does anything independently of your body. I promise you, if, you're, if, you're, if your body stayed home and your head came here, it is a bad day. <laughs> Jesus, the Bible talks about us being one with him. We are members one of another. He being the head, we're the, we're the body. And it, it astounded my heart that God would so move supernaturally. Because, and again, in, in our human reasoning, we begin to think we're trying to get God to do something instead of understanding it's something he has already said that he desires to do. He's already declared his will in the earth. And it's my responsibility through a raw faith that's not based on anything of my own, empowered by the grace of God, to, just to begin to say, if God said it, it's so for me. I magnify, which means enlarge God. And the larger God gets, the smaller your prison walls get. The reasons that you don't step into what God has for you. The reasons you stay in behaviors that are destroying your life and your marriage and even your kids. Nobody choo no one gets up in the morning and says, hey, let me destroy my life. No one does that. But we sometimes don't know how to get out of those areas by learning how to. In these next three weeks, I'll be talking to you about what it means in Scripture to walk with a raw faith, empowered by the grace of God. So that what God's called you to do for him in the context of his kingdom and in your personal life, that you know how to step into it no matter what you've experienced in your past. And this Bible school is going to be a time where we're going to give a sound theological training. We're going to teach them the understanding of the work and the person of the Holy Spirit. We're also going to give them a practical application. This won't just be people called to speak in a, in a pulpit setting, but all the different facets of ministry. There'll be a practicum attached to it. And, and, and I knew in my heart because again, you know, your human nature, you just want to kind of hem things in. Well, you know, there'll be just a few here and there. And what, what he was putting in my heart, and I began to say before Rodney spoke to me, is they'll touch the world. They will go to the far corners of the world and bring the only hope of the earth to those places. Not just there, but all, here at Victory and all through the region. Jesus said the laborers are few, but the harvest is plenteous. There's not a harvest problem today, guys. There's a laborer's problem. And we are going to, that's part of the call of this church. Now, you may be sitting here and think, well, whoop de doo I'm not going to that. What do I care? Here's, what you, here's why you need to care. Because the God of heaven wants that done. And he's your God, and it's your church, not my church. I go to Pastor John's church. I don't have a church. I'm a part of your church. I go to your church. I, we go to, this is just a body of believers, not any better or worse than any other church. But we are called to something very specific. And if you're a part of this, listen to me. Whether you have a part of it or not, you're called to it. And you need to join your heart to it. 
Because the God of heaven wants this done. Because the, the, he's desperate to see the next generation be able to step into the purpose and plan of God for their life. The second announcement I have for you, this, this, is one, this one's a lot of fun, and uh, is on November 6th, we are going to break ground on the new facility for the, for the additional space. So we're ready to go. Thank God. Now, the, uh, that, now here's the interesting thing that happened. I, I didn't talk about the building anymore, didn't say much about it. But when I got over into a place of raw faith, income started to come to the church for that reason. Didn't say anything. Do you know why? Because God's people hear his voice. And when you step into a place of faith, as a, you see, as a leader of, of a church, as a leader of family, you can thwart what God is doing in the people that you're responsible to care for. And people, with no prompting, no messages, nothing, began to give. And in one instance, one situation happened where that, that had been going on for 10 years and a $450,000 amount of money came to this church in that, that same time frame. Why? Because there's something about the grace of God. There's something about the grace of God in the enablement of God that no human being can do. You say, well, I'm a pretty bright guy and I, or girl. I'm glad you are. I'm so thrilled you are, but you're not that bright. This world will take you out, and the devil in it will take you out. No matter how smart you are and sharp you are, and I'm glad you are. I like hanging out with sharp people. It makes you look sharp. <laughs> but the reality is this. I, in these spaces, we're going to do the things that God put in our heart to do. And I've already been speaking these out of my mouth by faith. And I have over to, and listen, these spaces, the, the first phase of it, and we're going to do it in three simple phases because, as I said, we're going to pay cash. We're not going to go into debt. And it will be a three-phase process. But the first phase, we're going to begin November 6th. And the first phase is going to give us uh, mainly, right now, primarily, space for meetings, meaning our small groups as well as the Bible school. And then we'll have some phases after that. I'm going to take literally two minutes and show that to you. But I'm not here to, to show you a building. I'm here to tell you about a purpose. Because in those rooms... We need to see, because what God has put in my heart, and I've been saying it over and over again, 2,000 people in this church will go through the marriage classes and will go through the marriage small groups and meet with marriage mentors, and their marriages will be increased. Where marriages are suffering, they'll be healed. Where marriages have been broken, they can be restored. And where people are already divorced, they can have their life put back together. You say, well, I'm already divorced, man. I mean, I'm in the middle of something, the biggest mess of my life. What about me? Can I tell you something about God? He knows how to go into any situation and restore your life. He said, but I've messed things up, man. Do you know that's why you have a Savior? Do you know that's why he's full of mercy and grace and kindness? If it wasn't for the goodness of God, the Bible said we would all be consumed. And I want, uh, it's desperate in my soul. 2,000 family, 2,000 couples going through these that will enrich their marriage, their marriages will get healed, or they'll put their lives back together in that environment. Then 2,000 people to go through the parenting small groups where you're meeting with a, with a, with a parenting mentor so that you can learn how, how to take God's word into the way you parent because this world and its system set ablaze of hell is destroying our children. Not someone else's kids, my kids and your kids. And the enemy doesn't play fair. And there is only one weapon. It's called the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And if you don't know how to walk in the word of God in your marriage and in your home, you're going to lose the most precious things in your life. And I, I'm telling you as your pastor, that's not happening. We're going to see 2,000 people go through that. We, we have small groups. By the way, just so you know, every room in this building pretty much is used six days out of the week. They're full. And on the weekend, we have virtually no space to do small groups during church. But I want families who, to come and take a six to seven or eight week small group about parenting or marriage while church is going on. Because people are a little busy today. And they, and they, they won't do it. You say, well, they should. Well, you know what? We all should do other stuff. <laughs> I should be a better husband. I know Michelle should be a better wife. <laughs> I'm teasing. Man, you know you're in love when you can tease your wife in church. Can't you? <laughs> you know. That's what he's called us to do. And then ultimately, it's going to create more children's space. And, and let me just show you three, three, real quickly, three simple phases. Here's what it looks like. Phase one looks like this. 
If you look at the bottom of the screen, that, there's the, uh, it, 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 it's mauve, that's the color. I, I don't know colors. Mauve on the left and then salmon. <laughs> and then blue and then we're back to mauve and a little bit of salmon. As you can see those spaces, that's going to be the first phase of what's built. It's a $2.9 million uh, a budget for the, for, the, for the whole building that we're, that, that, that addition. We have about 1.8 million plus on hand. Balance needed during construction, uh, construction, a little over a million. At your level of giving even right now, by the time it's done, we'll have paid for that completely uh, cash and it'll be debt free. <laughs> now the second phase, if you'll look at it, enables us to take that, you see where it says the office space? That office area there is only going to be roughed in in the first phase because we don't have the cash to do it. But it'll be $200 to finish out the office space. He said, well, we're, you know, I don't care about offices. Well, you know what? We don't either. We're putting that last. But the fact of it is we, we have people in to under, to, literally under the risers or people working in, I mean, it looks like a cave. But it's just where we can, and our staff has been wonderful about it. But I still love the Pastor Steve's in a closet back here. <laughs> Doesn't that just tell me, just doesn't that warm your heart just a little? Come on, man. Just makes me, thank you, Jesus. I'm hoping we can keep them back there in the closet, but I don't know, you know. But then the third phase is this, is you see where it says future classrooms. That's where our offices are right now. Those will be converted to children's space and we'll actually build the, the actual office wing. That's the last thing we'll build. Now, here's what I'm believing God for. Here's what I've been saying by faith. Father, I thank you that the first phase is debt free and that we will never stop building. Now, we could stop if we want to, but I'm believing God and I'm saying by faith that we will just continue to go to the next phase. We'll, we'll build out that, that office space and then we'll build out the office and we'll never stop construction until it's done. And we're going to go get busy doing what God's called us to do because we're not here to build buildings. That's why I didn't really say much about the buildings because I don't care about buildings. They're going to fall down. But the work that will be done in these rooms is going to change generations. And literally, we will use it as, for the Bible school as well as the small groups. And then, of course, we need additional children's space. And if you're here in this 11 o'clock service, you may be in the room and go, we have all kind of room in here. We're in two Sunday services, not because we need space in here, but because we're out of space there. You say, well, that's just kids. It doesn't matter. Really? Only in church do parents think that way. And it blows my mind. And parents, they give their life for their kids anywhere but church. Well, you know, that's not that important. Can I tell you, if your child does not know how to walk with God in this darkening world, and none of it's going to matter. And thank God that over 50% of the square footage in this church already is dedicated to the next generation. And it's about to go over 50%. That's what we're here for. And we will win the battle with our families by the grace of God. As I wind this down this morning, I want to encourage you. So how do you, how do, how do you actually see a multiplication occur that God wants in your life? In, in the case of the church in the next five years. You've got to be able to say what God says. Listen to me, please. In the face of everything that's contrary, in the face of whatever you're dealing with, whatever prisons may have been built around you. See, many, all of us think of, of other people of having lesser problems or lesser issues than us. But the fact of it is, we, if you're not, life has a way of putting you in chains. It has a way of putting you in a prison. And, if, and it's, it's so easy to do it where you begin to look at and you begin to define the walls of your prison and the length of your chains and you begin to magnify your limits. But the Bible never tells me to magnify those things. It says magnify your God. Raw faith is when you stand in the face of impossibility and you say, let God be true and every man a liar. In humility, in a, with a humble heart, God, I say what you say about the families of this church. I say that the marriages and I speak it out of my mouth about the families and marriages, about your kids. I speak it out of my mouth about the 300 churches that we're going to see. See, every, our church is designed to do four things for you. Number one is that you come here, I want you to know God intimately. Then I want you to find freedom. That means get rid of the junk that life and the prisons that's built for you. Then I want you to discover your purpose and fourthly make a difference. And I want to ask you a question. What will it look like? If this place multiplies by reaching the lost, reaching people for Christ in the next five years and 300 churches 
are doing the same thing in this region. It will change this region from the inside out. The church will actually be the salt and light it was called to be. That's the mission. That's the vision. You say, how are you going to get there? I have no idea about all of it. I don't know how God's going to do it all, but I know this much. My job is not to be the strategic guy. It's to say God will do it, and I will obey him, and it will come to pass, and we give glory to Jesus. That's what's going to happen. Happen, happen by faith in Jesus' name. And I'll wind up by saying this. When we started this church 24 years ago, in fact, this month is our 24th anniversary as a church. And uh, Michelle, this is the prayer we prayed 24 years ago over and over again. We prayed it through the years a lot too. We knew what God called this church to be. We knew it was to be regional in scope and influence. And I talked about it our first Sunday with the 33 people that were brave enough to show up. Now, they all looked at me like I was crazy. But they were like, what are you talking about? Don't you know? You're in a cinema. Don't you know that we're not even coming back because you're crazy? That's just the truth. But here's the prayer we prayed again and again. Father, we know you've called us to lead this. We have no idea how it will happen. And, and I said, this is how I prayed. I, honestly, I said, God, I, I, I really think you should get someone else for this job. I wasn't joking. I was saying, Lord, and in fact, a couple times through the years, I gave him names. I'm not kidding. I said, I said, Lord, so-and-so, I'm telling you, he's remarkable. He could do this. Because, again, I was trying to think of somebody who had capacity and abilities that I didn't have, and it wasn't hard to find those people. But what I found out that God was looking for was not the smartest, the brightest, and the fastest. He was looking for somebody who would simply not magnify or enlarge through pride anything around them more than they would God. The greatest act of humility you'll ever have in your life is not when you walk around with your head down. Hum the greatest act of humility is when you step into a raw faith and say what God says in the face of impossibility and you humble yourself to what God says about you in the face of impossibility and you keep steadfast if let God be true and every man a liar. And the grace and the enablement of God shows up and he'll take you places you never dreamed possible. He invites you. He invites you personally. The God of the universe invites you personally personally into a custom designed mission for his kingdom and for your personal life the next three weeks i'm, I'm telling you there's so much in my heart it's like it's like drinking out of a fire hose i just man i'm just oh that these next three weeks i don't care where you've been how you got there who messed you up who you messed up you don't have to stay there and god is going to speak to people's hearts He's going to speak to people about what they should do in this church and for their purpose in, in God's call. Even financially, you mark this down in the next several years, financial gifts will come into this church because God has called people to the gift of giving. It's in the Bible. It's no better or worse than any other gift. But they'll honor God. They'll obey God. It will come to pass. And it won't be a striving. And, and, it's, and I'm a lousy fundraiser, okay? But I'm not a fundraiser. I'm a faith raiser. That's my job. And I'm going to raise the bar of what God's called us to do. It will come to pass. Our children will walk with God. Your marriages will, will be increasing. The brokenness that this world offers will, will be bended. Broken hearts put back together. I'm telling you by faith, I see it as clear as I see you. It will come to pass. And your part is to join your raw faith. Begin to say what God says about not just this, but your own life. Begin to say what God says about you in the face of all of it. Humble yourself. In these next three weeks, we're going to walk this through. I'm telling you. And at the end of it, you're going to have an expectation in your heart that, it's, that it will be larger than everything you see around you. Because God has an amazing plan for your life. He really does. Let me pray for you. Father, I pray for every person here under the sound of my voice. Whether they're here in person or watching online. Nothing, nothing, nothing is impossible with you. And Lord, I pray that today that, today, that hearts of humility are before you today that we lift nothing up above you. We acknowledge nothing and say nothing is greater than you. And we quote what you say in your word, let God be true and every man a liar. Today, we magnify our God. Father, I pray for the men and women in this room, the generations that are in this building and the generations we're called to touch. And I thank you that what you will for them will come to pass, that we stand before you to fulfill your mission in the earth. We will do what you called us to do, and you will show up with your amazing grace and do things that are beyond human comprehension. And we will see in the next five years a multiplication that will exceed the past 24 years combined just in the next five. Father, we thank you that. We thank you for the next generation. We thank you for all of these things coming to pass. 
And I pray that every person in this room now experiences your supernatural power in their life and the presence of the, of the Holy Spirit of our God. As every head remains bowed, every eye closed, if you're here today and you don't know Christ as the Lord of your life, if you drew your final breath and were to slip into an eternity today, do you know where you'd spend it? And let me say this, the service is not over. The best part of the service is just about to happen. The last two services we had, we worshiped together. The Spirit of God fell. The Holy Spirit fell in this room. Bodies were healed. God moved in people's lives. I'm telling you guys, God wants to move in your life. And He wants to move when you come to church. He wants your life changed when you come in His presence. But if you're here today and you don't know Christ, I didn't ask you if you're a good person or you went to church or were baptized. Those are all fine things, but there is no church or any membership or any sacrament of a church that can make you a Christian. No church, including this one. Have you ever given your life to the one who gave his life for you? Have you ever invited a Savior, Jesus, the Son of the living God, who died on a cross, buried, and rose from the dead for your salvation into your heart? If you've never done that, I want to pray for you right where you're seated. In fact, the whole church will pray this prayer out loud together with you right where you're at in your seat. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, if you're here and you'd say, I don't know Christ as the Lord of my life, Pastor, and I want to. I want to invite Jesus into my heart. Or perhaps you're here and you have in the past given your life to the Lord, but you're so far from God today and you just feel like God would want nothing to do with me or I, I, I don't see the way back. You don't work your way back. You come back because He wants you and He loves you and He forgives you and His grace is sufficient. And you can leave this place with your past gone and brand new, afresh, going after what God has for you in your life. And nothing has to define you behind you. So if you're either one of those conditions, you say, please include me in that prayer. Every head is bowed, every eyes closed, including those of you watching online. Say, please pray for me. Just right where you're seated right now. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Would you lift your hand just where you're seated and I'll include you in that prayer. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. One last moment. Just want to look around and make sure everyone's had that opportunity. See, include me, Pastor, in that prayer. You see, I'm not embarrassing anybody. Just simply raise your hand where I can see it. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. God bless you. Listen, if you raised your hand or you should have, pray this out loud where you hear it. Jesus will come into your heart. He will never leave you, never forsake you. Pray it out loud where you hear it. Let's pray together. Say, Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. And I believe with all my heart that Jesus is the Son of God. He died on a cross to bear the debt and burden of my sin. I receive you today, Jesus, as the Lord of my life. Thank you for coming into my life, making me brand new. My sin is washed away, and I am now heaven-bound as I boldly confess Jesus is the Lord of my life. Amen. Amen. Give him a hand. Best decision you ever made in your life.